What's that? Say it louder. Everybody say it. Say it again. The gospel. That's right. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Before, before I get started, I'm going to share something a little personal and uh, just uh, in, in, um, in being transparent as your pastor. Um, our son Adam has relapsed, as some of you know, and uh, we, we, um, that, that was hard for our, our family, for his wife, and, um, but we also saw God do something in opening doors miraculously and uh, opportunities, and he, he agreed to go uh, to rehab. He saw his need for that, so he went back to Georgia in rehab, and we're with the counselor there, we're working a plan. Uh, he's going to be working a plan to reunite his family and and uh, everybody get the, the help and the counseling that they need. Um, it's a Christ-centered place, spirit-filled, and I uh, just wanted all of you to be aware, to be in prayer for Adam, for our family. Um, and I don't want to leave it sitting here like this because... God has great things for Adam and his family. I believe it with all my heart. Many of you have seen, our family has seen, other people have seen. God, Adam has a calling on his life, and uh, he's much like his father in his resistance. And uh, Adam and I had a great talk before we brought him up there. And I encouraged him to just surrender, just surrender. And there's been proof of that going on even in the last two weeks that he's been there. So pray for him. We're encouraged. We know God's going to do great things. And uh, your prayers, we love your prayers. And uh, we just want to be open and transparent because let me tell you something. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. It doesn't matter who you are in the body of Christ. If you're in the body of Christ, you're a threat to him and he's going to attack. And so we want to rise up as a body and beat him down. Can I get a good amen? All right. All right. Pastor Mike started us off with the gospel. That's the gospel. This is what we have to hold up. This is what has to be true through the entire series. The lampstands that we talk about, the seven lampstands are the churches of God in all of these cities that we're going to talk about. I told you about the church in Ephesus and that it was the apostolic church. Great things happened there. It was like the who's who of churches. They, they were sending people out. The gospel went out from Ephesus and the church grew and the word spread and people were saved and they had their first love. They got away from the grace and started to focus on the works. And so we want to continue to be part of that gospel of grace. We want to always be focused on the gospel of grace. Then Pastor Josh brought us a message about the church in Smyrna and their suffering and challenged us. Could your faith, could my faith stand up under suffering? And we had to ask ourselves that question. If we were to get persecuted, if we were to have hard times and struggles fall on our life, our family, on our hope, would our faith stand? Only you can answer that question for yourself. And last week, though I wasn't here, I did watch it on live stream. Well, recast, I was was actually speaking while you were speaking. So, <laughs> But uh, the church in Pergamum, they were confused. They were confused between the line, the lifeline of Jesus Christ and the anchor that was sin. See, I watched. I told you, I watched. And that's, that really goes very well into the next church. And God really knows what he's doing, let me tell you. The church in Thyatira. No, I wasn't lisping. It is Thyatira. And that's the church that we're going to talk about this week. As we've shared these seven churches of representations of the churches throughout the era, throughout the history of the church. And so 
This church, Thyatira, if we get the graphic, there it is. Church Thyatira is that church that's had a really long run from about five or 600 A.D. all the way to 1500. And this is that medieval time, that medieval church. And a lot of things went on during this time frame. And this is the time of Constantine. This is where this church began. Many of you may have heard of him. And in an, in an attempt to unify religion, in an attempt to unify the church, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, tried to unify all the religions, regardless of what they were worshiping, regardless of who they were worshiping, regardless of their differences. He tried to bring them together. Isn't that just a wonderful hope and thought that can't we all just get along? The problem is, is that pagan worship doesn't blend with the worshiping of the true God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we can't blend the two together, yet Constantine tried to blend these things together. He took some of the uh, rituals and the, the, the stalwarts of the faith of Christianity and tried to blend them in with other religions and even pagan worship. He took the Lord's Supper and he made it something that it was never intended to be. He made it some kind of uh, ritual of body and blood rather than it being symbolic of Christ's uh, death and burial on the cross and a, and a memorial for what he did to us. He took uh, Mary and declared her the queen of heaven and made her an equal intercessor with Jesus Christ before the throne of God. Now, I, I'm not here to... to uh, to, to, to bash any religion or anything like that, what I, what I, what I want to do, we can look into this all in a, in a very uh, deeper form, maybe a word on Wednesday sometime. We just don't have time to get into all the what's and the who's here. But he also instituted and tried to create this hierarchy of religious leaders that could be controlled by the state. Priests and bishops and cardinals. And you know where I'm going. So... Uh, but it was, a, it, was a, it was an attempt to have control, a finger of control within the religious sect that could be controlled from Rome. And so, as I said, we can get into this deeper another time, maybe on Wednesday, but there's far more pressing things going on. This is just where that era kicked off during that time of Constantine. And it lasted about a thousand years and even continues to this day. But the, the issue really is, is I've seen too many churches and too many pastors take hits just like this church in Thyatira and their lampstands have been removed. Their churches no longer exist. The doors were shut the people were dispersed. And ultimately, if you look at the church in Thyatira, and we're going to read through this section in just a second, but if you look at it, you can sum up this church in one word. And this word is going to ring true in you. It's going to, it's going to resound in you. You're going to say, oh, I know that word. But this word sums up what the church in Thyatira became. It's a single word. This church is the tolerant church. The tolerant church. Thyatira was a tolerant church. In that in hopes of getting everyone to come together, everything became okay. Everything became acceptable. Everything became something that could be part of the church. Okay? So I'm going to read through this quickly, and then we'll break it down. I'll read it through in its entirety, and we'll break it down, starting at Revelation chapter 2, and we're going to start at verse 18 and read through verse 29. I'll read through the whole section. If you don't have a Bible, but you'd like a Bible, put your hand up, and someone will bring you a Bible. Revelation, last book, all the way in the back. So you only got like this much left. So the story's almost over. It's Revelation chapter 2. 
starting at verse 18, going through verse 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. It always comes up, doesn't it? You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality, eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father God, we praise you this morning. Because you are good, you are mighty, you are sovereign, and nothing passes by your throne that you are not in control of. Lord, we just ask that as we look at this church in Thyatira, as we look at this age, this Thyatiran age, that we could pull from this what we need to be doing. And continue to do well. And set aside what we might be doing that does not honor and glorify you, Lord. Because it's not about us. It's not about how we feel. It doesn't matter what we feel. It doesn't matter what we see. Our hope will always be in the one true and holy God the living word who is Jesus and the written word he gave us as his guide, the Bible. For it's in his mighty name we pray, amen. All right, we'll do the first two verses here. To the angel of the church in Thyatira I write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now this is the words of the Son of God. This is the words of Jesus. Do we worship Jesus? Do his words mean something to us? Yeah, they do. Yeah, when he says something, we know it's important. It's in red, right? So we know it's really important. His eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. As you get into the book of Revelation, we're not going to go through the whole book. We're just doing this first part. But you have to understand it's written in apocalyptic writing. And what that means, there's a lot of symbolism. And, and everything that John sees and is writing down is symbolic and trying to paint a picture that's much bigger than the picture that's being described. And so this blazing fire, his eyes are like blazing fire, it means he sees everything. He sees everything. He burns through every pretense. He burns through every motive. He sees every single attitude of the heart. He just doesn't see the action. He sees the attitude. And everyone went, oh boy. Because he understands that sometimes we do things for the kingdom, but sometimes we do things so we look good in the kingdom. 
And that's not what God's talking about. Jesus wants us to be able to understand that he sees it all. And we're doing it solely for the king, solely for the gospel, solely to spread the word, solely to be a light. That's the only reason we do this. It's for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of people to come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why we do this. And his feet are like burnished bronze. What does that mean? That means that he's been where you've been. He's walked the road that you've walked. He's weighed, he's felt the weight of the trials that you have had. And he's stayed standing strong. And he wants to walk alongside you. He wants to hold you up. He wants to gird you up in the strength. He sees what you're going through, and he wants to be strong for you in every step that you take. But he wants you to be there with him. He wants, he wants to be with you. He wants you to invite him into the process. And then he says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, and your service and perseverance. And now you're doing even more than you did at first. Doesn't that pump you up that he says, I see your deeds. I see your love and your faith for the people. And, and I see your perseverance. You kept on and you kept on and you kept on. And, and now you're doing even more. Doesn't that pump you up? Well, let me tell you, they were more pumped up in the first service when I went through this. <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> At 9.30, all our volunteers gather right here, and we go through a little bit of this. Yeah, you guys were here, right? Yeah! And we talked about this very section of Scripture. They did more and more and more. And this is what Jesus looks at and says, yes, you did amazing. You kept on. You kept serving. You jumped in. Even when it got tired, you kept doing it, and you did more. You kept on going. Why? Because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the gospel. It's about the light. It's about loving people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the motivation. And they read that and they were so excited. And they were, they were jumping up and down. Yes, we did good works. And then he said, nevertheless... And everyone went, oh boy, here it comes. Revelation 2, 20 through 21. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. And nevertheless, I have this against you. And what does he have? You tolerate the woman Jezebel. Who is this woman Jezebel? Well, if we go back a few thousand years, many thousand years, in 1 Kings 18 and 19, you read about this woman named Jezebel. And she was, she was married to Ahab, the king of Israel. And she led people astray. This, this, this woman Jezebel, she, she began to kill all of God's prophets of that time. And up rose a prophet named Elijah. And Elijah was, was bold for God. And he went up against the prophets of Baal. That's who Jezebel was worshiping. The prophets of Baal. He went up against them and killed hundreds of those prophets. He killed them. But then Jezebel got a little angry. And she said, I'm going to go after Elijah. And you know what Elijah did? He ran. He ran like the wind. Ran as fast as his little sandals could help hold. Put his little robe up and he said, I'm out of here. This gives you an idea of the influence that Jezebel had in the kingdom. The influence that she had over people. That even this man of God, who had risen up against hundreds, literally hundreds of prophets of Baal, was afraid 
of this woman because of her influence. So this going on in the church of Thyatira is not necessarily a woman named Jezebel, though I suppose she could have been named Jezebel. I don't doubt that that's possible. But she had this spirit of Jezebel. And there was this spirit of Jezebel that was there, that this spirit that taught false things. But not just that, a person of great influence, like the Jezebel of old. That even the prophets back down from her like Elijah because she has such great influence. She stands with such authority. And this is not just about a woman. It could be a guy who has that spirit. But standing with great authority, great influence, that no one wants to speak against them, but they're misleading people. That that. That they, they, they can't follow Christ or they won't follow Christ because they're following this person. And she's, they're leading people astray. The, these teachers mislead God's people. They change and manipulate the word of God. Many cults start right with the word of God. They take the word and they manipulate it for their own purposes There's usually one strong ruler within a cult that is usually getting something substantial because of the cult, often having to do with sexual immorality, often having to do with giving over of all your possessions. So this sexual immorality, it could could be literally they were sexually immoral, but it could be. That their intimacy was immoral. Their intimacy with God became something that it was never intended to be. Their intimacy, their spiritual intimacy was with something other than God. Their immorality was in that realm of intimacy in that they were giving all of their heart, all that they are, to something other than God. And they were offering, they were eating food offered to idols. You know, the word of God is often described as the food, the bread of life. And so they were, the the food, the teachings, this could be they were eating the food of idols. It absolutely could be exactly what it says. But I think it's so much deeper that they were taking in the food that is the teachings of idolatry the teachings against God, that they were taking this in as nourishment, spiritual nourishment, that they were growing in paganism. They were growing in faith that was not a godly faith. This is where they were. They, don't, they didn't just let the truth be the truth. They were worshiping other things, consuming falsehood, See, when we worship only by our feelings, then we can get really far from the Word of God. And Tyler sang, it doesn't matter what I feel, it doesn't matter what I see, my hope will always be in your promises for me. And that's what we have to stand on because feelings come and go, don't they? Yeah. I mean, we can feel... it was. That was the best worship ever. Yeah, but if it was Ozzy Osbourne singing about Satan, then, you know, it was a good song, that the, the melody was good for you, but the message was terrible. See, sometimes we, we get engrossed in things that are absolutely leading us away from God because it's our feelings. Our feelings drag us away from the truth. You know, 1 Thessalonians says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 24 says this. Do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. We each, if we know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we each have the spirit living within us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. And we can either let his power reign and lead us, or we can quench him and lead ourselves. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. The prophecies it's talking about are the prophecies that are the word of God. Prophecy is sometimes 
telling, foretelling the future. But sometimes prophecy is talking about the very word of God that he gave. And so do not treat prophecy with contempt. Don't look at the word of God. And when it tells you that this is not good for your life, you'll say, well, I don't feel like that's true. We shouldn't care how we feel about something. We should care more about what Jesus said about something. That should be what we care about. And if our feelings don't match it, oh well. We gotta get over it. We have to look at the why. Why did God say this even though I feel this? Because God has something better for you. God has blessing for you. He wants you to do it this way because he has blessings within it for you. He doesn't want to tell you what to do. He wants to offer you a better way. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? There's a better way he's offering. And we should be grabbing onto it, white knuckled. Because there's nothing better. There's nothing better in life than trusting what God has for you and adjusting your life accordingly. We too often look what God has and we try to adjust the word of God accordingly to fit the culture. That's completely backwards. Do not treat prophecy with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. He will do it. If you put your trust in him... That he himself will sanctify your body. He, you can walk your life in peace regardless of what's going on if you just do it the way God says. How many times do things come up in our life and we just fade into the emotions? We become dark and toxic. We become overwhelmed and broken down because we're feeding into the feelings Feelings are not bad things. They help identify stuff. You know, when someone calls you a name, it's okay to feel bad because guess what? They didn't treat you good. So now you identified what was going on. That's good. Because otherwise you walked around like, oh yeah, hi, I'm a moron. They called me a moron. I guess I am. You got no feelings. You don't care about it. So you identify yourself just like everybody else. But no, if someone calls you a name and you say, oh, I'm a child of the king. Yeah, yeah, I feel bad because you think that way of me, but I'm going to keep walking the way God told me to walk, and you're going to see something different because I'm going to walk in peace regardless of what you think of me. Amen. That changes a heart. That changes a soul. She's been given time to repent. Isn't our God amazing? Isn't that a great verse? Even though it's talking about Jezebel who's leading hundreds and hundreds astray, God says, I gave her time to repent. How many of us need some time? Don't take too much. Give him some time to repent. This Jezebel, this Jezebel era within the church, the slide that we saw, went on for about a thousand years and still has pockets of it today. This church in Thyatira, gave, God gave him a thousand years to repent before he brought in the next church era. A thousand years. He's patiently waiting for the tolerant church and tolerant believers to repent. Oh, God's got big patience, man. He's got big patience. Second Peter 3, 8, 9 says this. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slow, slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to... Say it. Say it louder. Say it again. There it is. He's patient. He's waiting. And repentance is just that changing of your mind, changing of your heart. Yeah, I don't feel like that's the right thing to do. Oh, wait a minute. God's word says that. I need to repent of thinking this is still okay. 
when God's word says this is the better way. We need to change our thinking, the renewing of our mind in Romans 12. We get our mind renewed and walking in the path that God gave us. He's patient. He's waiting for you. He has open arms. He's saying, I'm still here. I'm still here. Even though you're trying to do it all your own way, even though you're walking away from me, even though you're consuming the, the food of idols, even though you're spiritually intimate with something else, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm patiently waiting for you to turn and run to me where it'll be so much better. You'll feel so much peace. You'll feel so much purpose in life. You'll feel so much joy. I'm waiting. I'm here. He's not willing that any should perish. Continuing on, Revelation 22 through 23. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. Unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who ser searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. This sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? It sounds a little, that's a little tough. I read that and I was like, wow. Strike your children dead. Whoa, I don't know. I might skip over that verse. I don't skip over any verses. Come on. God will make his way bright. Regardless. And we look at this. And, and those who follow her, he'll put on a bed of suffering. And those are just the people following along. Hey, Jezebel, she's great. I'm going to go see her today. Jezebel's speaking over there today. I'm going to go over there today. Those are the followers. They're not really, they're not, their whole heart isn't in it, but they just keep following and following and following. The children are the ones that take in the message and start to teach it again themselves. Those are the children. Not her physical children, but her spiritual children that are repeating the message. They're taking it in and they're owning it and they're repeating it and they're teaching it and they're getting converts for themselves to this pagan message that is against the glory of God. God will not have it. He'll give them time to repent. But he will, he will show that he is God. See, we say, God is love, though. God is love. He's perfect love, but perfect love cannot be separated from perfect justice. Because perfection is just that. It has to be perfect in every arena of principle. Every arena. So it can't just be perfect love. It has to be perfect justice as well. So when there's a rejection and we follow something else, God will only tolerate that so long. And if we're teaching something other than the gospel, if we're teaching a different gospel... If we're teaching something that is not in line with the word of God, God will only tolerate that so long. He will give you time to repent. But we need to step into that repentance. Revelation 2, 24 through 25. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, not the ones following Jezebel mindlessly, not the ones that have taken on the message and teaching it, these are the ones who are part of the church. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except... To hold on to what you have until I come. Because here's what he's saying. Many of are going to fall away. Many are going to chase after Jezebel. Many are going to start repeating her teaching. And they're going to start looking at you and me like we got two heads. They're going to start telling us, oh, that, you want to follow that message? He's, that's why he says, hold on. The ride is going to get hard. How many of you know the ride's going to get hard? Yeah, not enough of you. Because let me tell you something. When the ride gets hard, that's when we find out where our faith is. When the road gets tough, that's when we know, is our faith real or are we just carrying it like, you know, an accessory? We were a Christian because it was 
a good idea to be a Christian. It was beneficial to me in my social circles. That's why I was a Christian. But is it real? Has your heart been transformed? Has your mind been renewed? Have you changed your ways? Are you changing your ways? Is it an ongoing process? Do you continue to repent in area after area after area of your life? Or are you just carrying it around like a purse? Doesn't this Christianity look good on me? Matches my eyes. Or is it real? Has it changed your life? Does everyone in your life know that you're a Christian? Let me tell you something, that was a hard transformation for me. Working in a prison, not being vocal about my faith, and then coming to the place where I had to fully surrender to God and realize that these people don't know. Why don't they know? Because faith was just an accessory. And now it's time to put it on as the full clothing. It's all I wore. Changed it over. Started to walk as a believer. Then donated, then volunteered my time as a chaplain for the whole staff. Let me tell you, I was scared to death. But God said, hold on. Hold on, the ride's coming. And what I found out was amazing. That God went before me. He opened doors I never thought would be open. I had people walking up to me, officers walking up to me, who I know wanted nothing to do with God in any way, shape, or form, and they said, I think it's awesome what you're doing. You really believe what you believe. I don't believe it, but man, I can see you do. That made a difference. It made a difference in them because they saw something different in me that I wasn't just wearing Christianity as an accessory, but I was wearing it because Jesus is worth whatever I need to go through to get the gospel message out. My life is a blip on a screen. Doesn't matter what happens. The only thing that matters is that Jesus Christ is glorified and the gospel reigns out and the peace of God is, lives in me and emanates out whatever I'm going through. That has to be my call or I might as well just stop coming up here and talking to you. Because the gospel, because Jesus Christ is everything. He's everything. And if he's not everything for you, then I'm going to ask you this morning to repent. And lay it down. Revelation 2, 26 through 29, the last part of this. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus says, you know, you get this. You get this right, you start working with me, you start doing it my way, you start reading the word of God, you start changing your life around, guess what? You're going to rule and reign with me. Come on, that's huge. We should be jumping up and down and doing a happy dance. Ruling and reigning with Jesus, come on. That's amazing. This goes into a whole other realm that I'm not going to go into, why we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. But the fact of the matter is, when we get this right and we walk with God, he says, when the time comes, man, when the time comes, you're going to be my homie. You're going to be right here with me, ruling with me. Did I seem really white there? I don't know. Does that? Huh? I thought I did. Yeah, I felt it. See, the world is looking for us to compromise so they can point a finger and say hypocrite. That's the clarion call. That's the deep, dark secret of Satan is that if he can make everyone in the church look like a hypocrite, no one will want to be there. He's doing a pretty good job, isn't he? That's the secret. See, because we talk about grace here, because I believe in the grace of Jesus with all my heart, with all my heart. But let me tell you, friends, grace is not freedom to sin, it's freedom from sin. Woo! 
Does God have patience? Yes, he does. Is there grace when we mess up? Absolutely. But our heart should be broken, just like his heart is broken. Just like when we keep on sinning, we're quenching the spirit within us. And our heart should feel that. We're grieving the spirit. Our heart should feel that. And it should make us repent and change our mind about those kinds of things. You know, Pastor Mike came out. Kind of shows you where the spirit of God is working. Because I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the current events that's going, going on in our world. We're not blind to the current events that are happening. But I can tell you right now, we will not compromise the light at Life Coast Church. The light will not be compromised. We're not going to change the gospel because the culture is uncomfortable with it. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, it doesn't matter if your neighbor is red or yellow or black or white, they are precious in his sight. Doesn't matter. They can be black, white, gay, straight, pagan, going to a church. It doesn't matter. Love them. Love them. That's the light. That's the gospel. Love them. The formula doesn't change. The formula hasn't changed for thousands of years. Jesus said to love them. Lost People need saved people to be the light, not the finger pointing at them. But with that, we still want to love people into a deeper relationship with Christ. Some of you may be thinking that I just contradicted myself. No, I did not. Because if they don't know him as Savior, we need to set up the meeting. We need to set up a date, don't we? I would really like you to meet my friend Jesus. I think you guys would be good together. He'll change your life. Because guess what? You can't change anybody's life. I can't change anybody's life. We can't save anybody. We're supposed to be the light, love people, let the Holy Spirit convict them, let Jesus save them, and let God take them home. That's what we're supposed to do. We look around and we see all this racial tension. You know what's happening? We don't have a race problem. We have a grace problem. We don't have the grace of Jesus Christ. When someone only knows what they know, you cannot expect them to act any differently. We need to have an understanding of what's going on. Let me tell you, I have a very interesting perspective in my life without going into a whole lot of detail. I was in law enforcement for 26 years, but when you look at me up here, you wouldn't look at me and see a police officer, would you? Because I'm not wearing that outfit anymore. Stacy and I, in our vacation, we're just on Ancestry.com, and uh, I've known this for many years because my father shared it with me. But I looked at my great-grandfather's census record in Virginia from the 1800s. And in the census in Virginia, my grandfather is listed as a black man in the census. And in Massachusetts, 30 years later, he's listed as a white man in the census in Massachusetts when he moved. My family was persecuted for interracial marriage. You would never know that by looking at me because I look very white. But I have an interesting perspective in that even though I don't look like I'm a police officer, and even though I don't look like I'm a black man, that heart, those hearts beat in me every day. And I understand what's going on. I understand the fear from both sides of this issue. And you know what? The resolution is still grace. It's still grace. We need to be pouring out God's love wherever we are. As a church, when someone comes into this body, we're going to pour grace on them. As they start walking with God, we are going to give them the word of God. So when something's going on in their life, if their marriage is struggling, we're going to say, have you done it like the word of God says? 
Because when you make these changes, that's when change happens. Are you struggling in your finances? We're going to come to you and we're going to say, let us help you. Walk in your finances like the Word of God. Because this is what it says in here, and there's peace in the words of God. If you're struggling with your neighbor, we're going to say, have you done it like Jesus said? Love your neighbor as yourself. Because that's what's going to make the difference. If you're struggling with things in your life, what does the Bible say about it? If you're struggling with raising your kids, what does the Bible say about it? It's in there. When you're struggling in your marriage, in finances, in in relationships, it's in there. Go to the Word of God or ask someone to walk with you in the Word of God. We're not going to change our stance. We're going to hold it up in love. We're not going to point a finger at people. We're going to point the people at the Word of God. That's going to change their heart. That's going to change their mind. You can't change people's thinking. You can only, the Spirit of God is the only one who can change their heart and their mind. That's my challenge for us today because you can't change the world. I can't change the world. Only the Spirit of God can change the world. He's called each and every one of us to change our world. Make a change in our world. And so I have these cards that's going to help you start a conversation. Start a conversation about love. James is going to help you with this one. Wherever he is. James has left the building. Here he is. So we have these cards. All it is is an invitation. All it is is an invitation to come to church where there's passionate worship, powerful messages, exciting kids' programs, relevant student ministries, engaging small groups, family atmosphere, and grace. Don't try to change people. Point them to Jesus. Let him change them. That's what he does. That's what he does. The Holy Spirit transforms lives. Look at me. If I was, if you ever saw me, man, you wouldn't even come to this church. I tell you, I did bad things. I did bad things, and I hit them from Stacy, so she never knew. Grace says, I don't matter what you, it doesn't matter what you did. It matters where your heart is and what you're doing. What you want to do for Jesus. So I don't know what your neighborhood looks like. I'm just going to ask you to take you know, five, ten cards, whatever you want to take. You got a box full of them here until they're gone. And just say, I am going to purpose to be the light in a dark world. I'm not going to argue with anyone. I'm not going to debate anyone. I'm not going to point fingers at anyone. I'm just going to say, man, come to Life Coast. We just want to love you. We just want to walk with you. We just want to introduce you to Jesus. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're going to show you Jesus. We're not going to give you any rules. We're just going to show you, tell you, talk to you about Jesus. We're going to let you read his word. And then if you want to change, we'll walk with you in that change. If you come to us and ask, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to challenge you. If you're struggling in an area, you come to me and ask, this is what you're going to get. If you're not ready to change, don't come talk. We'll pray for you, but we're holding this up. The gospel, we're holding it up. God's way, we're going to tell you it's better. We're always going to love you. We're always going to love you. But we love you too much not to tell you the truth love you too much to let you keep doing it the way you're doing it. We love you too much to not help you change through the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you too much to let you sit here week after week after week and not get invested in the one who gave his life for you. Faith changes hearts. Stand with me. We're going to sing and I'm going to encourage you if you want to give your faith some legs because James says faith without deeds is dead. If you want to grab some cards and start to change your world one conversation at a time, 